to Ian. Well, I have been looking forward to this week for several weeks now, actually a couple months, I believe. Um, many of you know Steve and Sandy Smallman, and they've been part of our community. Um, shiny, we, we've been sharing them with another church for, for quite a while now. And um, if you know Steve, and I have particularly gotten to know him within the last year, more so, and I'm grateful uh, for his friendship and his um, care for me, uh, very much a pastor's pastor. Um, Steve has um, served as a, as a pastor for, for quite a while now, and he was a pastor at, at a senior pastor at McLean Presbyterian Church in Virginia before coming here to serve in the Pennsylvania area for World Harvest Mission, and he has served as an interim pastor for several churches, and, um, and I, I think churches that I, when I first became a Christian, I, there were books that we would see on the table that were used for communicants classes, and we, we use the book now even for our new members class that, that he authored, and um, it's just been a tremendous help for me just to be able to speak to him and get to know him uh, more and more in the last year. So I, again, when I, when I asked him, I was a little bit nervous, and he said, absolutely, um, to come and preach, and, and I'm just glad so. And so we helped me in welcoming him to come and open the, the word of the Lord for us. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Angel. Actually, uh, my ties to this church go back to 1967. Do the math, somebody. That's a little higher math for me, but I think it's 50-some years ago, but I came here to Philadelphia to go to a conference at Westminster Seminary, and I stayed with Dr. and Mrs. Richard Gray next door in this lovely house. I think you and Brittany are living there now, aren't you? I, I love that house, and Dr. Gray became a, a real spiritual father to me in my very early years, so. And uh, I could go through any number of ways we appreciate uh, Calvary Church. In, in the recent uh, years, you've provided a wonderful, you women have provided a wonderful uh, safe place for Sandy to come and, and teach and uh, have fellowship, and we appreciate that very much. And, uh, well, we could dwell on the past and all these connections, but uh, what's important, of course, is the present and the future. Uh, going forward, this is uh, going to be quite a year. Uh, politically, of course, we're reminded just of this awful storming of the Capitol, the anniversary on Thursday, and uh, reminded of the, the stormy political environment and what in the world's going to happen with COVID going forward. But it, this is also an important year for uh, you folks here at Calvary. Lord willing, you'll have a new a senior pastor uh, by this time next year, and a new chapter in the life of this congregation will open up. So uh, I've been reflecting on uh, what I could uh, talk about this morning. Uh, Angel gave me permission to preach on any book in the Bible but Acts. <laughs> because I know you're resuming that, that study. And... Uh, the book of Acts is a book about the Holy Spirit. Uh, technically, you see the title uh, Acts of the Apostles, but it could just as easily be named Acts of the Holy Spirit as uh, you read about what is really a sacred history of what God did 2,000 years ago in establishing his church. And uh, it's such an important study. I'm so glad you're doing that. But alongside that is the question of, well, what is... What is the Holy Spirit doing now that the church has been established? And Ephesians is a wonderful book that uh, describes that. And so I thought as a, a compliment um, and uh, with uh, Angel's encouragement, I want to study with you this morning the Holy Spirit as reflected in the book of Ephesians. Uh, you'll find that printed in the um, bulletin if you want to follow there or your Certainly welcome to open your Bibles uh, to the book of Ephesians. There are two passages that I want to read. And so will you please give attention to um, 
the scripture, and we're moving toward that command at the end of the passage, which says, be filled with the Spirit. That's our focus this morning, but give attention to the scripture. Would you stand as we read the word? First from chapter 2 of Ephesians. And he, that's Jesus, came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to you who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Then chapter 5. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, and please be seated. So the question this morning, my friends, and the challenge for you is this. Do you want to be a spirit-filled church? Seriously, if you're a member here, do you, do you want to be part of a spirit-filled church? And I know it's not in the DNA of Presbyterians to talk back to preachers, but I at least hope in your hearts you're saying, yes, yes, I want this. Oh, God, would you be pleased to make this a spirit-filled church? Can you say that? I know I'm raising some questions. And some of you who perhaps are new to the whole business of church and the Bible, and you know something of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, at least as part of your worship, but, but spirit-filled, that, that kind of sounds a little dodgy. Maybe I'm not sure what that wants. Or maybe you've had experience with what are called spirit-filled churches, and that's not really what you want. You have issues. Well, whatever, I want you to take seriously what is right here in the Bible. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, what does that mean? Well, as I thought about it, um, I thought maybe it would be best to say first what Paul doesn't say here. He doesn't say, be baptized with the Spirit. Now that takes you back to what you've been studying in the book of Acts, if you've been part of what Angel's been doing over these last uh, several weeks, because that's what Acts is all about, the baptism with the Spirit. In fact, if you, if you think for just a minute, you realize it goes farther back than that. And as John the Baptist was proclaiming his message 
at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he said, I'm coming to baptize you with water for repentance, but one is coming who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Of course, he was referring to Jesus. And when Jesus was baptized with water by John, he was also baptized with the Holy Spirit. God the Father sent the Spirit as a dove upon him. And in a very uh, literal sense, Jesus carried out his ministry by the power of the Holy Spirit. So much more we could say, but fast forward to the resurrection and the days following the resurrection. And Jesus taught his disciples about this mission that was to be theirs and about the kingdom of God, it says, through the Spirit, when you look at Acts chapter 1. So it's not like the Holy Spirit began uh, at some point. The Holy Spirit's always been present in the church, but something new was about to happen. But Jesus said, don't start on this mission. Don't leave Jerusalem until you are baptized with the Holy Spirit in just a few days. And he was caught up to heaven, and sure enough, he did exactly what he promised. And in a few days, the Spirit was poured out upon the church on the day of Pentecost. And there were uh, a mighty roar, we're told, and tongues of fire were falling out of heaven, and the, the apostles were speaking in foreign languages that they never knew before. It was spectacular. God was starting something brand new. That's what baptism represents, isn't it? Something new. And he did it for the Jews, first of all. All those people present at Pentecost on that day were Jewish believers. And so it sort of spilled over to the Samaritans. And you've studied about that in chapter 8. Uh, and you're about to study the further spilling over of Pentecost onto the Gentiles, to the nations. That's coming up, and it's, a, it's really actually, the, in a sense, the question that occupies the whole New Testament. Can you really be a follower of Jesus and not be a Jew, first of all? Well, stay tuned. And by the way, why did Jesus baptize his church with the Holy Spirit. Remember the text? It's really the key to the book of Acts. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the nations, to the ends of the world. So just as Jesus carried out his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit, so we, his church, are to, are to serve and minister in the power of the Holy Spirit. But if you think about it, that was the end of the discussion of the baptism with the Spirit. And this continues to confuse people. And, and perhaps, I, and I hope this is, at least somewhat helpful to you as I talk about this. Um, our Pentecostal friends, for example, insist, and they're wonderful fellow believers, but uh, they really say, unless you've had a Pentecostal experience, which for many means speaking in tongues, you really aren't there yet. You haven't arrived. But that's not what Paul talks about here, does he? The baptism happened. It was... It was a new start. It was the beginning, but it was for the church. It was for all of God's people. And now the apostle says, be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit's now dwelling in his church. That's something that's wonderful and new. That's why this passage that I first read is so important. Look at it again, if you will, please. Chapter 2. For through him we both have access, that is, Jews and Gentiles, in one spirit, in one spirit, to the Father. 
So you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. Now notice, in whom the whole structure, reading verse 29, in whom the whole structure, that is the church, made of Jews and Gentiles, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. I mean, the whole Old Testament is filled, filled with the, the anticipation of God's presence among his people, and they built the tabernacle and then the temple. But where is the temple now? Right here. Where is, look at the next verse. I love this text. In him, that is in Christ, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Friends, do you believe this about Calvary Presbyterian Church? I really think Paul is writing this to his readers. You too, which could be the Ephesian church, but just as well to, to the readers this morning. My friends, you are the dwelling place of God. Now, right here. I mean, I look around, you look around and you say, are you serious? <laughs> Us? Well, do we take the Bible seriously? You too are being dwelt, built together to become the dwelling place of God right now. And in a certain sense, I guess you could say the spirit, I mean the church by its very nature is spirit filled. That's, that's the way you define the church. I mean, apart from the spirit, it's not a church. This might be a, a, you know, an assembly of nice people who have a pretty building and they love to sing hymns, but apart from the Spirit, it's not the church, right? But we are, in fact, the dwelling place of God. Nevertheless, while the Spirit dwells here among us, we still now have the command in front of us, be filled with the Spirit. What more do we need? What is Paul saying? That's the, sec that's the second passage that we read, chapter 5. This is the end of a long and important discussion in chapter 5 of Paul telling the believers what it means to walk in him. Walk in love, if we read the first verse of uh, chapter 5. Paul, uh, we read in verse 15, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And then he curiously says, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. I, I say curiously, I'm not sure why exactly he uh, picked on that imagery. I've heard some people say, well, that means you should get drunk on the spirit. In other words, lose control, go crazy. Sometimes they're called holy rollers. This is another thing I think that gets a little uh, uh, something of a stumbling block for people when we talk about the Holy Spirit. But Paul is very clear, no, he does not mean that. In fact, he calls, you'll notice that text, and do not get drunk with wine, for this is debauchery. I mean, maybe Paul is saying, uh, be under control of the Spirit. Uh, that's certainly good, rather than wine. But nevertheless, let's, let's just look at the command itself. Focus on the words, be filled with the Spirit. He's speaking to us this morning. If you're looking at the, the notes that I had printed, you'll note a reference to John Stott. I want to 
<clears throat> I put it in there because I want to give credit to where credit is due, as they say. That this is not original to me, but it, it recalled for me actually a remarkable experience way back in 1976. As Angel said, I was pastoring a church in the greater Washington area, <clears throat> and there was a conference, a sum, summer conference that was held at the University of Maryland, and for three weeks, they brought in three of the greatest teachers of the 20th century uh, to teach the prison epistles of Paul. One week was J.I. Packer, who came and taught Colossians. Then the next week, James Boyce came from here in Philadelphia, taught the book of Philippians. And then John Stott came and taught the book of Ephesians. What an opportunity. Uh, and it was a book that Stott wrote about Ephesians that came out of that conference and other teaching he'd been doing. And I looked it up again to remind myself, I'd never forgotten his talking about this, but there are four things that Stott points out about the verb, the command that's here, be filled with the Spirit. And they're worth remembering. First of all, this is a command. This is not a suggestion or an option. Wouldn't you like to be filled with the Holy Spirit? It's simply a command. Be filled with the Spirit. Secondly, uh, <clears throat> it's in the plural. It's not addressed to individual Christians here and there that some may be filled with the Spirit and some not. It's really spoken to the church, the whole to the whole community, all of you. In the old English, it would be the word ye instead of thou. Ye, all of you, be filled with the Spirit. We all need to hear this command. Thirdly, Stott pointed out that this was in the passive. I guess you English teachers would help me. I think it's a passive mode. In other words, it's not something we can do ourselves. But it's something that has to be done to us. And so the Spirit it comes to us by the, by the grace of God. We wait. We receive the filling of the Spirit. We don't make it happen. And fourth, and, and very importantly, this is in the present tense verb, or a progressive sense. In other words, we're not to think of the filling of the Spirit as something that happens once, some sort of dramatic experience, I suppose. I have been filled or I haven't been filled. But it's something that's ongoing. The sense is be being filled with the Spirit. Scott pointed out that in the command that Jesus gave, you remember, to the uh, servants when he was changing the water into wine, they, he said, he said, fill the water jugs with water. And that was in the past tense. In other words, do it once. Fill them up. That's not the sense here that Paul uses. He's saying, be being filled in an ongoing, continuous sense with the Holy Spirit. Friends, hear the command. And maybe in the longer sense, it says to you and to me, be being filled, or I, I guess better even, be ye, all of you, being filled with the Spirit. Well, how does this happen? Well, is there some practical way to understand what it means to be being filled with the Spirit? Um, uh, forgive a sort of a, a lame illustration, but it works for me at least. <laughs> it doesn't explain everything. But, but how about thinking about the church as a gas station? Well, in fact, don't we call a, a, a gas station sometimes a filling station? 
And what do we do with the filling station? Well, we drive our car up to the pump, we fill up with gas, for what? So we can sit there? So we can have, oh, my tank is full? No. We fill up our tanks so that we can go somewhere, so that we can drive out and do our errands, so that we can uh, go to school, so that we can go to work. You know, just carry on life. And so we spend the week out driving our car, and what happens? Well, we use up that energy. We're, we're using up the power. So, and probably about a week later, we drive back into the gas station, and what? We fill up so that we can go out again. Well, I think this is what, what's described here. I mean, we come to church, we gather with God's people, and interestingly, by the way, if you look at the text again, very briefly, but notice that everything that's described after the command to be filled with the Spirit is something that we do together, something that we do as a church, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart, always giving thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of the fear of God. So we come together. We open our hearts. We're, we're gathered as the people of God in the dwelling place of God. And the Spirit comes and fills us. For what purpose? So that we can go out and minister. Jesus said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. Now, witnesses means more than what we typically call witnessing. That is telling the story. That's important. But being witnesses of Christ talks about living, walking, raising your family, being honest in the way you work, showing mercy to your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself, serving him as a caretaker, as a, as a caregiver. That's what it is to be Christ's witnesses, and, and we're out there serving him in the world. And what happens? Well, we, we're using up our energy. <laughs> we're, we're kind of running out of gas, giving out. But that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to happen. Because what happens? Well, a week later, we circle back again. We come back to the body of Christ, to the temple, to the place where the Spirit lives. And we take in the Spirit. We're fill, we fill up so that we can go out again. And doesn't that describe, it certainly does to me, a healthy church of receiving anew the filling of the Holy Spirit week after week after week after week? And I have to tell you, for me at least, uh, about a week is what, ta what it takes. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I have found that if I'm away from church for more than a week or two, uh, I start running out, I mean seriously running out of spiritual energy. I, I just don't care as much anymore. I don't have the compassion that I should. I don't have the desire for the things of God. I really do believe, friends, that this gathering is where we are filled with the Spirit again and again and again. And think of it. A, a, a gathering of people who come thirsty for the things of God, sort of a giant sucking sound. You know, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. And together we're filled again. And Jesus, in a sense, you know, the gas stations have to be filled themselves. And so this, the Spirit, you know, fills the church that flows then into the people of God that flows out to the world that is thirsty and in need. And when that dynamic is happening on an, as an ongoing basis, that to me is a spirit-filled church. And that's my prayer for you this morning.
one of the other things that was going on in my mind as I was thinking and anticipating coming to be with you was reading a, a short book on the Holy Spirit by a, a man whose writing I admire named Gordon Smith. Uh, and I, I have to say, I don't think I learned anything new about the Holy Spirit as I read. But the best thing about the, about the book is the title. It's a very nice book. But here's the title, and I want to stop and just let you hold on to this as we prepare our hearts for communion, as we just dwell on this idea as Angel leads us to this wonderful gift of the Lord's Supper, a place where we meet Jesus again. But the title of the book that I read is this, Welcome, Holy Spirit. The Spirit is here each week as we come to church, but I don't think of a better thing we could say in our hearts, whether we use those exact words or not, but to, but to say, welcome, Holy Spirit. We want you here. We want to be with you. We want to ask you to fill us again and again and again. That's my prayer for you, my friends, uh, Sandy and I again. Uh, cherish our times of fellowship with you and, and do consider this our other church. So we're glad for the, the fellowship and the body of Christ. When we finish the communion, you'll notice that we're going to sing an old uh, chorus. Uh, I'm sure it's familiar to most of you. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. That's the way it was written, I think. But if you think about it, I really think it should be Spirit of the living God fall afresh on us. We need to think not so much of what God will do for us individually, and I don't mean to say the Spirit doesn't work some great things in individual people, but I want us to think more in terms of, of a community, that we are, we together are being filled, being filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit of the living God, Fall fresh on us, we're going to sing. Break us, mold us, fill us, use us. And then, yes, we should sing it personally as well, individually. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. So you'll notice we're going to sing it twice. Let me lead us in prayer, though. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we live together under this extraordinary mystery of the Holy Trinity. And Father, it's been your pleasure to send your Son, who gave his life for the world and rose again from the dead. But you've also been pleased to send your Holy Spirit to empower your people to carry out this great mission for who's sufficient for such a thing. So teach us what it is to wait and bow before you and say, Holy Spirit, come, fill us again, empower us to be your servants in this world, to be your witnesses. Spirit of God, come and dwell among us with power and energy. And thank you for, the, for this communion meal that's now before us that does represent it, the, the eating and the drinking. And may this indeed be to us spiritual food and drink and send us forth full of the Holy Spirit to serve you and bring us back again to refill us to serve you. Be in our midst. O oh, Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.